back to um, the notion of uh, transformative leadership, so, uh, the title of the talk, Transforming Yourself to Transform Others. Um, a few years ago, as perhaps most of you may recall, unless you're suffering from short-term memory issues like majority of the world. We went through this tiny event called financial meltdown when a lot of financial institutions collapsed. And there were a bunch of studies done in terms of you know, trying to find the reasons for why the meltdown happened, why financial institutions were collapsing. And if you filter through all the complex uh, arguments, then The most sort of suggestive data indicated that the systems collapsed because of greed and deceit. That beyond greed and deceit, there was nothing else so complex about the reasons for the collapse of the meltdown that caused uh, quite a bit of grief globally. And in the aftermath of the financial meltdown, of course, there were quite a few criticisms very vocal criticism of educational institutions, business schools, schools of management, who were claiming to educate a new generation of leaders, or who were claiming to educate business leaders, and so on. And the idea was that, you know, if this is what financial leadership looks like, or if this is what leadership in financial institutions and other places look like, then should business schools, should schools of management actually make such claims. Perhaps they should be content by saying that they're educating better managers rather than leaders. And so there was a lot of criticism around this. And a lot of universities reacted to this criticism. And they started to look at, well, what are the gaps? What are the gaps that led to some of the most brilliant individuals to make decisions that were short-sighted to make decisions that uh, did not reflect a culture of ethics. And so many of them sort of started with various kinds of programs on ethics. And I think much of the effort at that time was simply to manage PR, that we are one of the first institutions of the first universities to now have an ethics program. Now, mind you, prior to that, um, a two-year MBA program perhaps spent three days on studying compliance. There was still no class on ethics, no, no uh, sort of engagement on ethics. And so we started to look into the overall trajectory and the life of an ordinary individual. And looking at the overall trajectory, you ask yourself that increasingly the society is becoming more and more secular. So individuals are either adhering to religion or not. And if they adhere to religion, it's mostly because of social reasons. So religion is a, is a social phenomenon. So they're not sort of exposed to the ideas of ethics and values in religious systems. And if they are, mostly it's done in a rather dogmatic manner. Family systems are breaking apart for good or bad reasons. So we are getting rid of the system that we had of intergenerational learning, where the notion of ethics or values was transmitted from one generation to another. And that's a fact. Whether we lament about it or not is another issue. When you go to schools, majority of schools actually don't have any programs on values and ethics except if you go to certain schools that are run by certain religious enterprises, then you might have a course on moral education and values education, which for the most part is just free time. You actually don't study anything. <laughs> and then you get to university. When you get to university, 
unless you're a philosophy major or somebody who's curious about studying ethics, you take Ethics 101, which is perhaps one of the most boring classes in philosophy. And you spend much of your time studying the history of ethics and sociology of ethics and so on. And then you graduate, and then you're out in the world, and then you're managing public policies, managing people's money, you're managing infrastructure. And there's this widespread assumption on behalf of people that people are going to be good, that people are going to be honest, that people are going to be kind, and that their professional values are going to actually reflect those wonderful qualities. However, in civic society, we actually have no mechanism whereby which we provide any kind of training on ethics to individuals. Now, you want to become a bureaucrat, you want to go into police, you want to join the legal system, you want to become an entrepreneur. For any sort of thing, you go into some form of training. You go into some kind of training and you spend six months to three years, or if you go into medical training, you spend five years to seven years, to become proficient in that field, to become experts in that field. However, not a single amount of time is spent on ethics training. People spend some time learning about legal regulations, and most of that is about what are the things that we should do in order to avoid a lawsuit. So when you go through medical school, they'll tell you about malpractice. Um, and how to avoid that. When you go into banking institutions, they will tell you, you know, at which point you should take up the phone and call your legal advisor to find a loophole and do something. And those are the things that primarily we spend time on. So we have tried over the, over the last years in most civic societies various kinds of regulatory mechanisms, ideally through which or by which we govern certain kinds of systems. But we have spent no time trying to help individuals understand why even be ethical? What's the value of being ethical? Why practice that? Because traditionally, when we speak of ethics, it has often been seen as just as a restraining mechanism. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And our monkey-like mind is such that whenever we are told don't do this, don't do that, we get curious. Well, what if we do? What if we actually go around and do something else about it? So this kind of mechanism of, of sort of strictly prescriptive methods of simply dictating to people what are good habits, what are bad habits, oftentimes doesn't work that well. And it certainly doesn't work well for the current generation. And so you have to look at how we can transform the very notion of how we study ethics and how we talk about ethics and how we discuss ethics. The first thing is, you know, why even be ethical? And the first thing to understand is that in any complex system, in any complex system, one of the ways in which you build consensus and one of the ways in, in which you make sure that the system flows smoothly, the system moves smoothly, is when people have respect for law and when people have respect for one another. Yeah. And when you study most of the complex organization systems, whether they're business or governance and so on, you begin to find that, firstly, those organizations run much more smoother, operate much more smoother, and have a greater sense of value and integrity if people are willing to work together and if people are willing to trust one another and follow similar kinds of protocols and norms. Yeah. And it works actually best in the worst kind of organizations that we can imagine. So a colleague of mine studies drug cartels in South America. Now if you look at drug cartels, they are very cohesive, loyal organizations. They have the highest standard of ethics. <laughs> they have the highest standard of ethics. Why? Because they realize that if they break any rules that they have built a consensus around, that if they're going to break, it is going to actually lead into billions of dollars of losses or losses of lives. Now, as an organization, I don't endorse their behavior and what they do. But if you look at the conduct in terms of how they operate their organization, perhaps it's one of the most ethical enterprises that you see. Now, that is rather disturbing for any civic society that 
The only example of good ethical organizations are drug cartels. Not business organizations, not government systems, not government organizations, but drug cartels. So, my curiosity around this idea of ethics came mostly in the framework of leadership. And mostly within the framework of leadership, my interest is that how do we create ethics as a system of optimization? As a system of optimization implying that how do we utilize information around ethics and in terms of changing behaviors of individuals and organizations <coughs> to create or to design sort of this conscious output that is going to be beneficial for humanity at large or beneficial for our ecosystem and world at large. So it has to do with designing certain parameters around ethics by virtue of which if we practice it as individuals or as organizations then we can govern the output in terms of whatever product that we are developing or whatever system that we are developing that it will have the maximum beneficial impact on human society. And so first thing we start looking at is how do you make an organization ethical? So by organization, I mean any form of organization, whether it's a business organization, corporate governance, government, uh, legal organization. How do you make an organization ethical? So when you take the top, the sort of top-down response to that, and you say, well, let's come up with, again, certain prescriptive measures that will create certain rules of conduct that every individual who's part of that organization should adhere to, should abide by. And very soon you recognize that you're not going to get a buy into it. Meaning not everybody in the organization is going to believe in everything that you believe in. So it's a terrible idea when boards set up ethical framework for the organization. Because majority of the members of the company or, or uh, members of business organization actually don't see the point in it. They don't see the point of why they should adhere to certain uh, ethical uh, parameters. So the best thing is, again, to look at, well, what is sort of the impetus that drives an organization to be ethical? And most of the data shows that it is actually individuals. That it is actually individuals who first turn to become ethical. Those individuals then in turn are contagious enough by virtue of their behavior to inspire other individuals to become more ethical. So then the idea is that, I mean, it's again, something that Gandhi alluded to, that be the change that you see in the world. Not that I agree with everything that he has said, but it's a, it's a, it's a good model to look at, meaning which has to do with the idea that rather than focusing on changing complex systems, you focus on changing individuals that built up those complex systems. It's much easier to operate in that manner. So when you're focusing on individuals to change complex systems, you have to begin designing certain mechanisms as to why is it that an individual should be ethical. And why is it, how is it that the individual will contribute to an organization becoming ethical? The first thing is to recognize that ethics by itself, we cannot simply give a blanket statement or a blanket rule that, that one should follow ethical regulations in this way. Because as we are finding out with multinationals cross-culturally, that certain practices that may be deemed ethical in one environment may not be ethical in another environment. So one thing that you recognize from the very onset is that ethics is contextual. One common example that I give to individuals is, uh, imagine you're an individual who believes in telling truth. You're an honest individual. And truth is sort of your number one value. And I don't know why I always come back to mafias in my example. <laughs> but imagine that you're sitting outside in a cafe and I will just presume that Hyderabad also has mafias. Uh, and you're sitting outside in a cafe and you're enjoying a cup of coffee. And it's a beautiful day. And you're sitting outside. And then suddenly, you see an individual, pretty well-dressed, good-looking guy, just rushing. He's sweating. And he crosses by your table and then he sort of runs into the back alley. Moments later, you see five or six other individuals coming with knives, machetes, guns. They don't look like law enforcement individuals. <laughs> they stop at your table, and they give you a perfect description of this person. 
who just went by moments before. And they ask you, have you seen this map? <laughs> now, you're an individual whose value is to always tell the truth and to be honest. What do you do at that moment? You'll have one group of people. So let's take a poll here. How many of you will tell the truth and say, yes, I saw the man, he went into that direction? <laughs> All right. How many of you will either say, I don't know, or I haven't seen this person? Now, how many of you will tell a full-blown lie, which is, yes, I have seen this person, and he went in the opposite direction? <laughs> you see, now, you see the dilemma. The dilemma is that we are, even if we believe that we want to be truthful and honest, we are presented at times with certain kinds of challenges and scenarios where we need to, we are forced to make value trade-offs value trade-offs in the sense of, you see, that whether we are going to value me speaking truth versus me valuing somebody's life. Because you've already played out the scenario, and if these guys get hold of this other person, the outcome is not going to be that great. Okay. Now, as you notice, majority of you were comfortable with a little white lie. A little white lie, which is, I don't know, I haven't seen the person, or silence, for that matter. So the majority of us have rationalized this idea that, well, I don't want to tell the truth because I don't know what the outcome is, what these guys are going to do to me or to this person. But the conviction is not strong enough yet to make a trade-off where we are able to say, I want to save a life, and I'm willing to lie for that. I'm willing to take a risk and lie for that. So this is just one scenario, but on a daily basis, we have to go through these kinds of value trade-offs, oftentimes. When do I tell a lie? When do I tell a white lie? When do I tell a small lie? When does that lie escalate into a bigger lie? Uh, when I, do I start bringing a whole storyline of lies? So these are the decisions that we have to make on a regular basis. So you see, telling truth is not the most convenient thing for the most part. It has to do with what kind of trade-off and what kind of value uh, trade-offs you're able to do or you're trying to do. So it's difficult to be absolute in your ethical parameters because we live in a complex environment where we constantly have to make a distinction between whether I'm going to be loyal, whether I'm going to be honest, whether I'm going to be truthful, whether I'm going to be kind. And these are the varieties of uh, values that we have to juggle with. And we have to make decisions based on which uh, one of those values takes a priority at that moment in time. Now, the deeper question becomes is how do we actually make those decisions? Because when was the last time I was presented with a scenario when I had to decide between life and death of a person? Or when was uh, the last time I was presented with a scenario when I had to make a decision of, well, you know, whether I should be fraudulent about, you know, a documentation, whether I should be fraudulent about the rate of interest, whether I should be fraudulent about a Ponzi scheme. I mean, that when was the last time in my human experience that I went through this process? So really, this, this notion that we learn ethical ideas or ethical behavior from experience is a flaw. Because oftentimes, if you become comfortable in one unethical behavior, chances are you're going to repeat that pattern. Mm. You see, because you just become better at rationalizing that unethical behavior. So the tricky thing then becomes is how do you train people to make ethical decisions. You don't want to be prescriptive, and you don't want to just leave it all as a gamble that just decide on your know when a scenario presents itself. Because what we have recognized, at least from the lesson of this five years ago, and historically this has all happened a number of times, was that you know, Wall Street was filled with some of the brightest minds, and still they were not making very informed choices. They were not making very ethical decisions. So part of the dilemma or part of the challenge is that 
we have to recognize that the ethical training or the ethical education process is a process of deeper transformation. A process of deeper transformation in the sense that people will be ethical only if they're willing and only if they believe that ethics will actually lead to a useful outcome or that will lead to a good outcome or that will lead to an outcome that they can live with. That those are the only reasons why people want to be ethical. And it leads to other kinds of context, which is if you look at most of the surveys, even if ethical individuals have lived under difficult scenarios, they tend to be happier people. If you're an unethical individual, you're constantly worried and anxious. So your rate of happiness actually goes down, by the way. So on a daily basis, you may be enjoying other benefits of, of unethical behavior, but the back of your mind, anxiety, fear, is always there. Mm. So you have to first recognize that, that what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? What kind of emotional lifestyle, what kind of um, lifestyle you wish to choose? And then the second thing that comes up is that whether we can give away with this idea of compartmentalized behavior. Because one of the things that we as human beings have become very good at, and of course education has contributed to it, is that we are able to hold two very differing ideas simultaneously. So for example, most of us think that it's all right to have unethical behavior when we are out at work. But when we are at home, we want to be accountable to one another. We, so it's very, we are comfortable when we are in a work environment to lie, be angry, and so on. But when we come home, we want our kids to be honest. Right? And we want them to be kinder individuals, and so on. So a simple question that I, that, I, that I pose to individuals is that if we truly, as a society, believe that unethical behavior is the path to success and achievements, that really the world out there is a competitive world, it's a dirty world, and the only way you can succeed in this world is by being greedy, by being deceitful, and so on, then aren't we doing a disservice to our kids by trying to teach them honesty and trying to teach them to be kind, that if we really want our kids to succeed in the world, shouldn't we make them experts in lying by the time they're 12 years old? Make them masters of deceit by the time they're 15. Because only then will we are ensuring, in addition to the education that they receive, that they truly will become successful individuals. So you see, we fear that idea. Because we fear that idea in the sense that we believe that it's okay for us to lie, but we don't want to be lied to. Right? So we are not sort of, you know, extending the courtesy, the similar kinds of courtesy and the similar kinds of breaks in unethical behavior to others as we're extending it to ourselves. Yes, and that leads to this kind of compartmentalized behavior or compartmentalized mindset where we tend to believe that it's all right for us in certain contexts and certain environments to be unethical, but in other environments, it's fine that we expect ethics to be the driving criteria, that values should be the driving criteria. So, the first thing is to recognize that our minds, that our lives are compartmentalized. That we are living such lives of compartmentalized values. The second thing to recognize is the complexity of the lives that we live, in terms of the choices that we have to make. So we need to make much more informed kind of, uh, we need to have more sort of sense of informed decision making by understanding what the value trade-offs are. And the third thing, which is far more important, is that in the long term, you have to begin to understand that, that what it is that you wish to see in the world. What is it that you wish to see in the society? Because it doesn't just start with the sense that the system is corrupt. Or it doesn't start with the sense that the system is like that. Because at the end of the day, you ask yourself, what is the system? The system is you and I. I think. And we are sort of the privileged 1 to 2% of the world's population that has some form of higher education. And if we, the empowered, educated 2% of the world, are going to blame the system, what's the hope for the rest of the 98%? Is it? So it's, it's important to recognize that the change in the system is not something that we leave to the future generation. The change in the system is where we have to begin with certain small disruptions, small experiments, 
in introducing ethical value into the system. So what does it all have to do with transformative leadership? Okay. The first thing is that we spend a lot of time studying you know, certain kinds of skill set and gathering certain kinds of skill set, mostly analytics and so on, that we think would make us better leaders. But if you actually look at the world around, and if you look at the leaders who actually inspire you, very few of them are actually trained in analytics. Most of them, you admire them for their leadership qualities is because you believe in their values, because you believe in what they stand for, you believe in what they represent. So the question then becomes is, are we willing to take the risk and are we willing to go through this process of self-transformation in order to become the leaders that we want to see in the world. Because the, the leadership is not coming from the top to educated, privileged group of individuals. And again, it's very valid for the rest of the 98% to say the system is rigged, the system is corrupt, and there's no hope, and there's no way to change it. So you have to, again, understand that you know, it's not just about talk for a better world. It's not just to talk about a better society. And it's not just even the idea of changing the world. It all begins with changing oneself, and changing oneself one day at a time, but taking the risk, taking the risk to understand that I may be a different person if I take this risk, that I may be a better person, but I will certainly be a different person. And there are some of the risks that I take with reorienting my own values that may not be most comfortable for me. Why? Because I have lived those values for 10, 20, 30, 40 years of my life. I have become comfortable. I have, I have become comfortable telling little white lies. I've become comfortable being unkind sometimes. I've become, I've become comfortable with all these things. So part of it is disrupting the sense of comfort by introducing or by injecting some of these new sort of set of ethical parameters, or ethical values in, in one's life. Oftentimes, you know, it's, it's a challenge because most people believe that they're honest. If you take a poll and you go around and you ask people, are you honest? They will say, of course, yes. <laughs> are you kind? I've never had a doubt in my mind. Of course I'm a kind individual. <laughs> and this is where the challenge of rationalization begins, which is that I perceive myself to be an honest and kind individual, but the person next to me sees the contrary. <laughs> and when the person next to me makes me recognize that I'm not what I say, I respond with anger. I respond with threat. <laughs> the first thing to recognize is that this process of self-transformation begins with radical honesty. Radical honesty, which is firstly destroying the perception that we have of ourselves. <laughs> because in all, re all proximity, we don't have enough data to convince ourselves. We have stories to tell ourselves, but we don't have enough data to tell ourselves that I'm a kind and honest individual. It actually implies that on a daily basis that I assess how many of my thoughts, how many of my actions and interactions were laced with kindness and honesty. But I actually never go through that effort of analyzing that data. So I have to actually rec recognize that I have to rely on the observation of individuals who are accompanying me or individuals who are next to me and individuals who actually don't believe in flattering me. Individuals who can be actually critical of me and critical of my behavior. And you gather that data to be able to see that what is the gap between who I believe I am versus what the world sees in me. And much of the initial process of self-transformation is to try to build a bridge between this gap. That who I believe I am versus what the world sees in me. Because <coughs> the values, the power of values is such that it is contagious. It is contagious in a manner that you won't be able to hide it. So if you're truly an honest, kind individual, you're not going to be able to hide it. It is going to sort of ooze out of your presence. It is going to ooze out of your being. It's going to show in every aspect of your interactions, your behavior, and so on. So values are something, just like bad values, good values too are radiating in, in their qualities. And they are contagious. So it's very important to not give in to the stories that we tell ourselves on a daily basis that of course I'm a kind individual and that of course I'm an honest individual because you have actually never tested those qualities. You actually have never you know, practiced those qualities at stretch to be able to say, yes, 
I am a kind individual. You have to also come to recognize that under what circumstances my honesty is going to be challenged. Under what circumstances will I become an unkind individual? So those are the things that we as rational creatures are able to measure. Those are the things that we as rational creatures are able to uh, predict and, and, and therefore change our behavior accordingly. And this process of self-transformation becomes sort of one of the best methods or best mechanisms through which you begin to transform the immediate community, the immediate environment, and in fact even the business world, the business environment and so on. Because when people are able to see you manifesting those qualities, they begin to assess their own qualities. You don't have to tell them that, you know, I'm practicing these values, what are your values? Mm. Human beings are reflected by nature. And so all you have to do is trigger, you see, be a catalyst uh, in terms of triggering these kinds of reflection process. And they will begin to say, well, I work with this individual. This individual has tremendous sense of integrity. It's an honest individual, is a kind individual. What are my values? How do I deserve to work with this individual? Or why do I deserve to work for this company? So most of the examples that we see in good corporate governance, you can always trace it down to a set of one or two individuals who exhibit the qualities, and that's why the company is formed that way. It's seldom the other way around, which is that, you know, I'm going to write a vision and a mission statement for a company, and that everybody is simply going to follow it. It never happens. In fact, there's a study done where we asked, you know, boards of certain companies to actually recite their mission statement. And most of them don't know what it is. <laughs> you ask CEOs and chief operating officers of a company, what, what's the mission of your company? And they won't be able to recite it. They've spent tremendous amount of money and time in hiring a PR firm to design a mission statement. But they have no idea what it is because they never cared for it. They never actually believed in it. So when we talk about process of transformation, it all begins with the individual never with a group, begin with an individual, and then it sort of radiates outwardly. And I think that's sort of one of the better methods or the better ways in which we can begin to see changes, better, better kinds of changes happening in the world. So this idea of transforming oneself to transform others is simply based on the premise that oftentimes we are too quick to make a comment or a judgment to transform the other. We are too quick to make an analysis and say, the system should be like this. That person should be like this. That organization should be like this. But we seldom actually look in the mirror, look at ourselves and say, what has fundamentally changed in us over the years that we can actually say that I'm a better human being, I'm a better leader, I'm a better mother, a better father, a better role model. These are the issues that we have to look at. And, and the other part that I'm going to just leave you with for a pause because I'm more interested in uh, the conversation part of things, is that because we live in a civic society that is highly contagious, whether you like it or not, you're a role model to someone. You know? Now you can go around wearing a tag saying, I don't want to be a role model. You'll still become a role model to somebody. <laughs> that's, that's just the way the society functions. And sometimes you're an active role model where people will actually tell you that, oh, I really admire you, and you're my role model. And sometimes you're just a passive role model where somebody is just observing you and saying, I really like this individual, and I'm going to imitate the behavior of this individual. So, so it, in certain regards, it becomes a civic responsibility for us to then display and show the best behavior, best behavior that is rooted in deep thinking, deep reflections of integrity, honesty, and so on, such that because if you recognize that you are a virus, a good one, or a bad one, but you are a virus, and you're going to have this effect, the choice is yours. What kind of effect do you wish to have? Meaning that whether you like it or not, you are a role model. What kind of role model do you wish to become? Because there will always be somebody who's observing you, who's watching you, and saying, I want to be like that individual. So focusing on self-transformation, I think, is one of the most pertinent and one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves. Maybe I'll take a pause here and we can just have a conversation and 
go deeper into other things. We have not had a more impactful talk in a long time at Mantan. Thank you so very much. I'll ask this young lady to help me. What's your name? Shweta. Now, Shweta will carry the mic. You will give it to the person I point to and take it back. Keep it short. I know there are a large number of people who want to ask questions. So keep it short and Give the mic back to back to Shweta as soon as you have finished your question. We will start with Sangeeta there. Good evening. Uh, you said uh, that a radical change has to take place a step a day. And we need to do a self-assessment and compare that with how the world sees us. Now, I have six, seven friends out here who know me for quite some time. Each one of them will have a different view. Now, how much of comparison do I de do, and how long does this comparison stretch? Well, first... It was all designed to make that noise. It, it's a way to keep me awake, <laughs> especially at this hour. Um, so let, let me sort of rephrase that a bit. So first thing is that you can always aggregate people's opinions. Okay? So seven people might see seven different things in you. But at the end of the day, you have to make your own decision in terms of what kind of individual you wish to be. Right? But people that you trust may be able to inform you on what are your strengths and weaknesses in terms of your own values and ethical behavior and so on. And you can decide which one you want to strengthen, which one you want to work on, because ethics is not magic. You see, it's not that you're born with certain ethical qualities. You have to cultivate them. You have to develop them. So when you do an assessment, it simply tells you where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and how do you transform those weaknesses into strengths. That's the only reason you're assessing yourself. The converse of it is that we human beings are also driven by something called validation, right? So the challenge that becomes is validation oftentimes works also in a negative scenario, which is that we only seek opinion of people who are going to validate some pre-existing condition right? And that's one of the major challenges, is that we by design then seek out simply to validate what we already believe in. That is a disservice to us. That is a disservice to our own sort of uh, aspect of self growth. Now, much of social media today is based on that validation algorithm. <laughs> okay. So, so you have to be very cautious. Uh, and in fact, it has some damage effect. You know, that's why Facebook recently uh, has been changing how you can uh, respond to certain kinds of comments. Um, just to go tangential, how many of you have heard of a thing called online blues syndrome? Online, online blues syndrome. It's this phenomena where you get depressed by being in social media. In, uh, Guruji, in fact, in the US, they have these detox programs uh -huh. to keep people away from... Uh, from social media. It's a, it's a simple mechanism. And again, it's because the algorithms are built on this validation mechanism. Because we're constantly seeking out validation. We're seeking out approval. Okay? So you're on Facebook, and you have... You know, you're surrounded by your close 3,000 friends. <laughs> and they're posting the best things that are happening in their lives. And day in and day out, you're looking at this, and you're saying, everybody's having such a great time except for myself. <laughs> and that's how the initial cases of depression begin, right? But then what happens is there's an event in your life, and you say, oh, this was wonderful. Let me post it. So you post that thing. And then every five minutes, you're checking whether somebody likes it. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, you ask yourself, these 3,000 people aren't really your friends. <laughs> By 20 minutes, you start having self-doubt. Whether this event was really important enough to post. Should I withdraw it? Should I delete it? You see? Because the mindset is so ingrained in this mechanism of validation that it constantly creates self-doubt. So when you're looking for assessment from trustworthy friends, make sure 
then it doesn't become a mechanism for self-doubt. Because leadership cannot be rooted in self-doubt. Right? Leadership is only rooted in clarity. So you're using this assessment to gain greater degree of clarity about this. Well, uh, good evening. I just wanted to ask is that people uh, are, uh, let's say, uh, an individual designs buildings or designs uh, something, which, you know, his uh, version of his ethics, they are seen in what he designs and what he does. And others feel intimidated with that. What does he do? Give me an example. Um, Howard Roke and Ayn Rand's fountain. Mm -hmm. So I, I think part of the thing is, when you, when you look at designing certain things, whether it's product or systems and so on, you're looking at sort of, you know, partly the utilitarian criteria. So how many people is going to harm us and how many people is going to help in certain ways. You can never deploy certain things at a massive scale that in the long run is going to be massively harmful to, to individuals. And I think that's where the borderline thing was, meaning, meaning that ethics is not a personal preference. We like to think that it's a personal preference. It's not a personal preference. It's a choice. But it's a choice that has large-scale impact. Because your decisions are going to have large-scale impact. Meaning it's going to have an impact on somebody other than yourself. So it's not just a matter of preference. Good evening. Some of us, by virtue of the profession we are in, we do get caught in a situation. To make it very brief, I run a recruitment firm. And amongst the many ways of sourcing candidates, one of the key methods is to actually headhunt from our client's competitor. Mm. Right? And out there's, there's a better term for it. It's called poaching. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, poaching is done by organizations from the other organization, not consultants, right? So in that context, one uh, policy that we have given, we have maintained for the last 16 years is we will not call the candidates in their organization, calling the LAN number, even if we have not had the candidates' other direct numbers. Right, right. So we get caught. Right. So I'm always questioned by my colleagues, you are giving us this stipulation, and therefore we are delaying sourcing the right candidate quickly enough. So are we uh, kind of accountable to the client or to you and your principles of not calling up and saying a lie? Because invariably I cannot call and say I'm a consultant and I want to speak to Mr. XYZ. Right. So what would you do? <laughs> I'll think about it if I ever entertain the idea of running a headhunting agency. Right? Um, well, first thing is, you know, to recognize that those firewalls were created for certain reasons, right? So if an individual is comfortable enough to give the landline number to the company, right, then there has to be clarity that I expect that phone to ring. I expect that other people in my organization might know that I'm looking for transition, that I'm looking to go someplace else. And that's a consequence that I have to live with. Yeah. That's a sense of clarity. Now, most times, you know, if people do recognize that you know, I am looking for a new place. I don't want other colleagues to know. Then I have to create that kind of firewall because I don't know if that opportunity is going to come through or not. Is it? It's, it's, it's risk taking mostly. Right? The ethics aspect of it is how clear I can be. And so I would just leave it up to the clients. Basically that if you are giving me a number in, inside your company, it implies that I can call you on that. It? it implies that you're all right with your colleagues knowing. It's all right for, with the organization knowing that you're actually looking for a transition. I mean, that is something that most clients will tell you, that I'm looking, but I have never told anybody. So please don't inform them. So, so that's just a sense of clarity. So I don't think the, 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 the burden of decision should be on you. The burden of decision should be on, on the client in terms of how clear that individual is. Good evening. 
I have a two-fold question. Number one, isn't it a lifestyle that is a reflection of leadership in one way? Because a child that is brought up in a fashion wherein ethics are not given that much of importance, what importance is he going to give as a grown-up? For a small example, we saw Japan, Japanese people clean the stadium after the World Cup, the Japanese section. That's because they they are in the habit of cleaning their classroom as students. So if there's no constant reminder as a student, how is it going to be a reminder as a professional? So instead of having ethical uh, workshop in the organization that you are in, shouldn't it be a part of this education system? No, that's a good point. The thing is, it needs to be through and through. It's not that certain organizations or systems should be immune to, to these kinds of things. Um, the case of Japan, which is one of my favorite countries, is not that you know they learn about ethical decision making in school. What they learn is resiliency. They learn to be resilient, and that's why, you know, historically and even in current scenarios, they are one of the societies that bounces back from tragedy much faster. You see, and with far less damage. You have, you know, a hurricane in New Orleans, and people are out looting. You, know, you have a tsunami in Japan, and people forego their meals to help others. So it speaks to the resiliency of the society and what people believe the honor code should be. You see? So that's, that's part of a nurturing mechanism. But we should not say that it's the responsibility of education institution alone. It's an overall responsibility for anything. And we should not also give up hope for people who are already in organizations. <laughs> so we should not say, well, sorry, you're 40 plus. There's no hope for you. Because <laughs> yeah. you truly believe that human brain is plastic and that by training, they, they can truly change their behavioral patterns. And so you tend to provide training at whatever stage in life that helps them transform their behavior for good. So, uh, so I had a question. Um, I don't know. It's, it's not just a question that I'm, I have got out from this talk that you gave. It's a question that has been always running up my head and it's quite pertinent for me. Nothing in the world can be demarcated as black or white. Mm -hmm. So you said when parents themselves are dishonest, they cannot entrust honesty on their kids. But then it comes from my personal uh, experience. Uh, my parents have always given me values which I think are quite high pitched in today's times. And because of that, I have many a times gone through situations where I've wherein I have stood on my values and I have been cheated by people. I have, and I have really felt very bad as an individual when I was a kid, even now. So now I'm moving to a much more practical approach in life. So my question was that when we talk of ethics, where does practicality come into picture? All of ethics is practical. If not, I'm wasting my time and you're wasting your time. <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is look at, look at this phenomenon. Now. So first thing is, your parents' value should not become your value. You should find your own set of values. Your parents' value, your teachers' value, society's value, they inform you, informing your value. But the second thing is this, you see? Now, if you say that I was cheated, and that's why I'm going to change my value, what you're essentially telling yourself is that I will not trust people, right? Now, what you're essentially saying is I will not trust people. Now, the question is that Will I extend the same courtesy to others? Meaning that, will I become a less trustworthy person for them as well? You see? The next fold of question you have to ask yourself is that, how would societies, how would any complex organization operate without trust? You see? So there's a casualty where, yes, you know, betrayal of trust happens and it happens often. But the fact is, imagine a life where you're not able to trust anyone. That's right. But the point is, I, uh, at a point in time when I'll become a parent, mm -hmm. yeah, when I'll become a parent, mm -hmm. I'll be scandalized by the very thought that tomorrow, when my children will go out in the world, mm -hmm. they will be deceived, they will be cheated by people, and they'll have to go through all the heartbreak that I or or people like me with my kind of values have gone through. No, I will not. 
think, let me let me interrupt you right there, firstly. Is that that's exactly what you're going to tell your kids? <laughs> you're going to tell your kids it's good to be trustworthy, and we operate. Ideally, a society should be a trusting society. But there are times when your trust will be betrayed. And at that moment, you'll have to make an informed choice whether you're going to trust this person or trust this scenario again. You see? But the thing is that you ask yourself the alternate, which is that because I fear being cheated, should I live a life where I cannot trust anyone? What would that life look like? Swamiji, uh, I want to ask a question not on ethics but uh, on the basic principle of Buddhism. Uh, according to Buddhism, the highest reality, in fact the only reality, is the no-self. Even the so-called uh, pure self or the real self is an illusion from the frame of reference of the no-self. Now, in the journey towards Nirvana, is it possible to jump directly from the illusory self of the mind? Uh, into the no self, or is it absolutely necessary uh, to first go through the pure self or the real self and from there move on to the no self? <laughs> first thing is that <coughs> it's very difficult to truly experience what no-self is. We have illusions about no-self as well. Why? Because we are informed from text and tradition what no-self should look like. So most of us are living in false self. False self, the self that is deceitful, the self that is, you know, interrupted by destructive emotional state, the self that does not make wise choices. And that false self is the one that makes our life miserable, that makes society miserable. And that false self is largely the reason why we suffer. My recommendation often is don't jump from false self to no self. Because if you try to jump from false self to no self, you will end up conjuring up your own imaginations about what this no self should be like. Right? So the journey has to be from false self to a more healthy self. And a healthy self is a virtuous self. It's a self that allows you to become a better human being, that allows you to play your responsibility in a, in, a, in a better form. And then you move into this no self. It's very difficult to operate in the world that we live in, as in the society, functionality-wise, by no self. So try to move more towards healthy self. And then, as one perfects the healthy self, then one gets more insight towards this notion of no self. I'll ask a question. Uh, are ethics objective? Or are they entirely subjective to a human? No, they are, they are both objective and subjective. I mean, objective ethics is ethics that we build around consensus. So the idea of trust, for example, or the idea of, uh, that we expect others to tell truth to us and we should be honest with them. That's based on consensus and there's level of objectivity to that. Uh, I believe most notions of ethics, shared ethics, shared values, are objective in nature. Subjective is how we interpret it, how we rationalize it, and how much impetus we give to certain set of values. So I understand that I should be kind, but how much kind should I be? That is a subjective interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, my actual question is not connected with the corporate world or the offices or anything. It's more on a personal level. Like we in India in a society, we live in um, extended families, relatives, and your uh, those family members. And uh, to uh, keep it in a harmony, sometimes we end up, not a white lie, but kind of a soft lie to keep the situation uh, nice and happy. Mm. To what extent can you do that? And without feeling guilty, like, you know, you say something and then you go to bed thinking, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. So that's. <laughs> That's a, that's a challenging question, <laughs> depending on who the key players are. <laughs> How much would you like to keep your wife? I'm not a mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pope Francis, a uh, uh, couple of years ago, he was giving a talk 
during a Valentine, Valentine's Day speech, and he said, uh, no. what's the difference between in-laws and outlaws? <laughs> outlaws are wanted. <laughs> I think family dynamics can be very tricky and, and uh, you know, at the end of the day you have to ask yourself that, you know, because it's still based on this criteria of trust. I mean, what's a family without trust? So you have to ask yourself whether, you know, the decisions that I'm making, are they going to truly nurture the individual and truly nurture the, this, this aspect of relationship? Otherwise, you know, it may be convenient at that moment in time, but later on, it might bounce back in a different form. Um, but my sense is that you can be honest, but there are ways of being honest. Right? And that's where part of the training is required. That honesty does not have to be always blunt. That sometimes honesty takes certain kinds of skillful methods. And so it's honesty with compassion. Uh, good evening, Guruji. This, uh, this is Professor Kiran. A uh, very interesting talk, but I, 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 you had alluded uh, to ethics not being cast in stone. There is a certain spatial, temporal, and contextual element to right. ethics. And I'm going to quickly tell you a quote uh, which talks about self-interest being the driver of human behavior. There is no good, there is no bad in this world. These are the whims of human will. Right. That which serves me well, I call it good. That which serves me ill, I call it bad. The, the issue is, there are times, oftentimes we are faced with choices when we do not know, in spite of our best intentions, that somehow the intention and action do not match. That we had the best of intentions, but the actions are not consistent, consistent with the laws of ethics. Right. How do you resolve this dilemma? Because intention alone is not good. You know, there's a Russian proverb that says, the path, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> and, and, and this is part of the gap that I was talking about, that oftentimes we may even be able to generate good intentions. But the intention doesn't always translate into action. So that's, that's the reason why I keep referring to the idea of training and, and, and deep behavioral change, which is that it's not just a matter of intention of doing good. It's a matter of also recognizing how do I manifest this intention in a manner that will do good. And if not, then how do I refrain from that action? And those are sort of mechanisms of informed choices that, that an individual has to train in. That it should not become just another method of rationalization. Well, I thought it would do good, but instead it did not. But I'm happy that I thought it would do good. <laughs> That's the level of disconnect uh, between intention and, and manifestation of that. Yeah. So it needs to be, you see, a very sort of analytical, informed decision making. You see? And the more you utilize that faculty, the more the brain becomes proficient in those kinds of choices. The second thing is that, although we can argue that often we are making decisions out of self-interest, but human beings as species have also shown greater degree of altruistic behavior. See, meaning that we are actually capable of altruistic behavior. We are actually capable of thinking of greater good. And so the question at a at, at certain point becomes that it, it's not that we all want to become martyrs. It's not that we always want to you know, move towards a path of self-sacrifice. But at the same time, the issue is that can we entertain the idea that what would my action bring to this pool of greater good? Because only those are the moments when we actually are successfully able to divorce ourselves from self-cherishment and self-interest, to be able to think of others, take others into our sphere of consideration, care, compassion, and so on. And we are wired to even do that. So at the end of the day, the question becomes which kind of wiring we are going to subscribe to. The, uh, this is derived from a reading of uh, Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Um, is human nature, is, are, the hum, are human beings by nature <coughs> deceitful? All this conditioning and the training and the corporate courses on ethics, mm -hmm. etc., are essentially uh, meant to, you know, kind of untrain the basic wiring of a human being. Is that 
something you subscribe to? Is that something which we need to believe in? See, I, I steer away from making bold claims about human nature. Uh, the more I understand human brain, I think much of these claims were premature. Uh, because there's so much about human brain and how we make certain decisions, how we make choices that we don't know. The second thing is to recognize that you have to ask yourself, what is a human being if you take away, if you take away the ability of transformation? Then you simply tell, you look at a human being and say, sorry, your nature is just that way. You cannot change. I don't believe you can change. I think it's a kind of violence. It's a kind of violence when you take away the possibility of change and transformation from another human being. So I think we owe it to human society to constantly give the sense that yes, they can transform and yes, they can change. And we have a you know, tremendous amount of behavioral data that shows that, that tells us that. Now, when you come to this notion of you know, corporate training program and all these things, not all corporate training programs were designed for the same purpose. Right? Some were, again, designed to make you better managers, not leaders. Efficient managers, not leaders. Okay. So you have to, again, understand what are the purposes for which these programs are designed. Uh, my name is Thomas. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, preacher must be an exemplary of the precepts he speaks. And uh, at any point of time, he must not make mistakes and uh, talk about uh, uh, some chances or what is your take on that? You know, once a preacher and a cab driver drive on the same day. And I'll take the Christian orientation there. So they stood in front of St. Peter's, waiting for the judgment. And so St. Peter's look at, looks at the cab driver and basically says, you know, here's the key to the golden room. And then he looks at the preacher and says, here's the room, here's the key to the silver room. And the preacher gets a bit agitated and says, St. Peter, there must be some mistake. See? I was the good guy. I was the preacher who was down there preaching the good news. Well, this guy is just an immigrant cab driver. So St. Peter looks at the preacher and says, Preacher, there is no mistake. When you preached, people slept. When he drove, people prayed. <laughs> But to, but to respond to your thing, integrity is the key thing. It, it, you know, we often encounter preachers who have tremendous oratorial skills, who are tremendous at preaching and so on. But at the same time, uh, you know, we actually develop tremendous respect for individuals who actually display that sense of integrity. What a brilliant talk. I really appreciate you sharing your views and uh, really uh, impactful also. Um, keeping with the theme of ethics and uh, principle-based and value-based management and leadership, uh, yes, it is very important to walk the talk and practice what you preach. And um, whilst we tend to do that and for the most part are successful, <laughs> we also live in a society where in the corporate world or in an entrepreneurial business world, society today is rampant with corruption. And uh, to deal with that, although within your company you might be ethical, moral, integrity, etc., but to deal with that, um, when you succumb to that, it has an effect on everybody who you have an impact on as a leader where you're walking the talk and preaching. Or, um, so when you have to deal with that, and some circumstances are such in today's world that if you do not deal with that, 
the circumstances or the repercussions on the business are terrible. And so that's a dilemma that we face, and it's very, very difficult to, to deal with that. What does one do in that case? Well, I mean, first thing is, you cannot expect for an overnight change see, uh, for a system that has been corrupt for a very long time. I actually like corruption in India, as opposed to corruption in the US. Corruption in India is transparent and negotiable. <laughs> As a consulting fee, or yes, whatever, yes. Right? it's it's cost or of doing speed, business. Speed, speed. Yeah. yeah, But but I mean that that's great. That's great. You can do that and, and pull your accountants. No, no, no. Oh, so, girl. but ethically, my my joke my joke aside, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually based on observation. <laughs> that, um, the thing is that again, you have to recognize what the long term cost is going to be of anything. Right? So we can be cynical about a corrupt system. But the fact is that an active corrupt system functions because we choose to be participants in it. And for the most part, small or large business owners, they choose to be part of it because it's convenient. Because it's convenient. Now the thing is that if you, if you take upon yourself the idea that I inherited a corrupt system, do I, do I want to strengthen and pass on this corrupt system to others in future generation, my kids? So I'm complaining and whining about this corrupt system that I have to live with. It's going to get more and more corrupt as cost of doing business becomes higher. Now, is that the suffering that I want my kids to inherit? And if it's not, then perhaps this is the right time to start disrupting the system. Now, that disruption is also going to have a cost. It's going to cause inconvenience of tremendous nature. Is it? Now, the issue becomes is whether I'm willing to take up that cost or not. You see, there are no passive spectators in a world of corruption. Is it? So, it's not that you can simply say to yourself, I inherit the system and it will just get passed on. Every time, by design, this is the theory of evolution, that by design, the more you participate in the system, the more you are strengthening it. And so you're going to simply create a much more robust, corrupt system for the future generation. So the question is, is that what you want to leave as a legacy for the future generation? And if not, then yes, there is a cost of inconvenience, but face that. Mm. Good evening. and. Um the outset, uh, Hyderabad must be very grateful that uh, you've chosen to establish an institute of ethics here in Hyderabad. As a doctor, what bothers me, having practiced in the UK for a long time and then now eight years here, there's a rapidly deteriorating ethics in medical profession and it's more so in cities and more so because the number of corporate hospitals have increased and so much so that the trust between the patient and doctor has taken a huge beating. So, given an opportunity, would you consider establishing ethics, because ethics is not taught in our medical profession, would you consider establishing a course in ethics if the government was to come forward in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana for requesting you to establish uh, a course in ethics so that it is taught in the medical curriculum? Certainly. That's my short response. Hi, uh, my name is Ranjit uh, Tunga, and I am uh, interested, I've done many years of meditation in my life. Um, I think it would be appropriate to ask you, the relationship between med meditation and ethics as you've experienced it and as you observe it. Well, if you want me to draw a relationship, of course I can draw a relationship. <laughs> the, I mean, all that meditation does, I mean, the, meditation is a whole spectrum of, of experiences. But what meditation does is it sort of creates a certain kind of conditioning in you to become more reflective, to become a more critical thinker, in a manner where you're able to better assess who you are at any given stage and what do you need to do in order to sort of move towards a given trajectory. So if you're you know, talking about becoming a better leader, better innovator, uh, a better individual, a better human being, 
what meditation simply gives is certain kinds of tools by which you're able to calm your mind, look at yourself, assess your values objectively, and say which direction should I move on. That's part of the thing. And then the other part of it is that, you know, it, any kind of contemplative tool or contemplative method, it also helps you to strengthen some of those systems. So uh, now there are quite a few sort of um, studies done in various brain and cognitive departments between meditation and the cultivation of compassion or meditation and cultivation of kindness, meditation and its impact on lessening anxiety and so on. Because if you look at it on a daily basis, how many choices or decisions that we make out of fear, out of anxiety. So if we are able to lessen some of those things, perhaps our decision-making ability will become much better. Yeah, good evening. I have a question. Saying where does ego fit in in all this? Because it is I, me, who has to change and in decision-making or validation. For me to accept, yes, I need to validate this or ask my friends or my trustworthy family members. The ego first has to, you know, I have to accept, yes, I want to change. So where does ego, what role does it play? <laughs> Initially, you simply have to train the ego to listen to things that it doesn't like to listen to. <laughs> and then you have to constantly talk to your ego, gently, by telling it that you're going to become a much better looking ego. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Guruji, for a wonderful speech. And we are very fortunate to and be grateful to Mantan for having us providing the evil the discourse. But uh, along with me and uh, I think many of the participants feel the same thing. I think it's an extension to Ajay Gandhi's uh, question and has implication of the young girl's uh, question. As you said that uh, ethics is, uh, uh, Ajay Gandhi asked if this is objective or subjective. Uh, you said that the, the most people share one ethics is ethics. But as a serious student of philosophy and psychology, I submit that this ethics is purely subjective. Because as the Engel asked that whatever the value system I practice, and I'm being cheated by somebody. So why that person is cheating this girl? Because that kind of value system is subject to that, to that person. He is believing that, that it is an ethics. So in this relativity of subjectivity and objectivity, and it is, it is practically impossible to derive objective ethics because with the limitations of the human mind. And uh, the only thing is that the way out, as uh, many of the participants are asking that, it's only propagation of the uh, commonality of the ethics. That's only uh, can be achieved by the people like you and the institutions that you are going to start in Hyderabad. So these interventions that which is more acceptable to many people, and that has to be uh, propagated. See, the, the, the thing again is that, let me just clarify what, what my earlier response was, that when you're talking about building consensus in a system, see, uh, for example, if you're trying to create an ethical structure in a government system, or an ethical structure in a, in a corporate system, you have to come up with shared consensus. And that shared ethics cannot simply be based on subjectivity. It's not a question of, well, today I feel like honoring this value. The other person doesn't feel like honoring this value because that is going to lead to a breakdown of systems. So in order to have any kind of system that is based on shared ethics and shared value, there has to be consensus. And in order for that consensus to take place, there has to be an objective view of ethics. Again, what I mentioned earlier is that the intensity with which we practice that, that's a okay. thing. So how much more honest should I be? How much more kind should I be? That's a subject. The idea that trust is a good thing is an objective. That honesty is a good thing is an objective. You cannot simply, I mean, in that regard, you see, there's nothing objective in human experience. Okay? From a Buddhist perspective, that's a lie too. That's a story that we tell ourselves. Okay? Because from, we have always been so ingrained to subjective thinking in a manner that we actually lose the objectivity of Good evening. Uh, my question is, so when I started working and then I started with my own business, there were two things, uh, two ethics that I followed. 
that were being honest and being hard working but through the process it so happened that honesty was something that you know i the people with whom i was working i'm how this did not sink and because of that um either you either i had to drop down my business close my business or buy into uh the the dishonesty or you know the opposite of honesty so now now after a while i'm thinking that you know it's the system that actually makes you you know try the other part the other part mm. the system or the surroundings or you know they, they, they make you do that actually so i'm thinking that it's it's not really good to be honest <laughs> Now, how would i justify this thank you uh, i'll i'll add a corollary to that to give you a context of uh, i'll i'll add a corollary to the lady's uh, question to give a broader context to it one of the biggest areas of uh, dishonesty that one faces in india is uh, corruption when one deals with the system and it is both with government and non government organization and it it's huge where almost everyone has to face it in daily life now economic economists have split corruption into of into two kinds one which facilitates things where you have no choice but either you wait for something or you pay a bribe and uh, and not wait for it the other is where you buy a favor okay and uh, there have been economists who have said that uh, the first kind is not as evil as the second one and uh, that's an extension to what the lady asked uh, how how does one deal with the situation in life if you are uh, forced in a situation where either you pay 100 rupees and get something get a birth certificate or not get it for the next 6 months when you you will you will be faced with uh, very difficult uh, consequences the other choice is where you pay money and get a favor so she she is she's talking of uh, something similar and m- mine is an extension of that so that's a broader question that many people will face and and want an answer to it. well i have no answer to it <laughs> um i i think uh, a lot of it will will depend on scenarios but the thing is that at the end of the day you know you have to recognize that human beings have tremendous capacity to rationalize any action any behavior and to rationalize it in a manner where they can justify their own actions we are wired to do that the more educated you get the better you are so at the end of the day you have to ask you see a deeper question which is am i happier by making the decision by making the choice do i feel like a fuller person by making the choice because those are the deepest choices that you have to again look into whether i can live with those choices or not okay. rationalization of those choices you can do it okay. the question is are you much more happier by making those choices okay. and the second part of this is that the second kind of thing i mean you can name it as a service transaction asking for payment okay. as a service transaction but the question becomes that is it simply limited to a service transaction okay. or is it inherently again building up the same corrupt system that i have been cynical about all my life if i was the sole bread and butter earner of my family i would have actually taken the other part to buy into the system yeah. but because because um, luckily i am not the sole bread and butter so i took the other part so that, then again there are two things you know if you are the one who has to look after your family you might have to buy into the system but if you have a choice you know maybe you can think about the other aspects but these are again these are difficult choices Uh, nobody said being ethical is easy <laughs> we were just saying it is perhaps good uh, perhaps it's meaning more meaningful perhaps it will create a much more happier and harmonious society i don't believe in an ideal world 
but yes, uh, these are the ingredients that, that might lead to that. Uh, the, the challenge often becomes is that, say I came into this particular behavior, for whatever rationalization, I'm the sole provider and so on. The next time I have the opportunity to make similar kinds of decisions, what do I do? The next time I have the opportunity to make similar kinds of decisions, what do I do? The next thing I know is that I'm wired to be corrupt. Right? So, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what is the long-term cost of every decision that I make? These are not easy decisions. Guruji, good evening. Uh, my name is Kapil. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, are all the morals and ethics only designed by the cream for the cream and to the cream? Um, because that's what the cream talks about, that we are morally